All right, I want to welcome you to Woodwind Methods today. Today, Jeff's helping me with the oboe, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, just putting it together, letting you hear it just a little bit, and uh, he's been kind enough to uh, pick this up and, and have, a, have his way with it. So, <laughs> uh, I think uh, starting with the oboe, how, how would you, Jeff, if you're, let's say, future band director that you want to encourage students to play the oboe, um, would you have the students switch from another instrument already to play the oboe, or would you start them fresh on it, or would it depend on the student? What would you say? I would probably have them switch, but definitely have a student who is consistent in practice, since oboe is such a complex instrument with such a unique embouchure. Definitely have someone who's already familiar with it, but also has good practice habits. Preferably someone who has played reeds, just so they're familiar with the style of vibration and what they need to get used to with how to cover the holes and fingerings. Good. So what do you think, like, a clarinet player would be a good swap to the oboe for you, or...? Clarinet is one, probably one of the better options because it's a similar instrument in the way that you hold it, the way that your fingers are going to be placed. Saxophone also would because saxophone is going to come into your mouth a little bit more uh, perpendicular to your teeth like the oboe reed is going to as okay. opposed to clarinet which is more at an angle. Okay, good, good. That's that's actually really good and I think that that would be, except the embouchure is going to be a little harder with the oboe. Um, your, your beginning student's probably going to complain a little bit more about the corners of my mouth feels tired because it's so small and they're that's why they all look kind of grumpy face, but that's that's just because they're utilizing all of their mouth muscles and they're very tight, corners stay tight a lot of the time, so it actually takes a while to build up endurance. So, okay. Um, should any physical considerations be analyzed before choosing a student to play the oboe? Is there anything, um, I know we've talked about double reads before and basically, you know, is there anything you think might might be a problem? Definitely how they're having their mouth placement, also the soft palate would play a large part in that, being able to get a good oboe sound on it. Okay, so um, the idea though with the double reed instrument that it's a little easier to play. If they have trouble, I think, muscularly keeping their embouchure tight for a long period of time, um, that could be an issue. Um, what they call hair lip, um, which also means that the soft palate up at the top of the mouth might be actually missing. So it's like open at the roof of the mouth instead of closed like a normal palate. Um, that really affects whether they can actually blow properly or the air will come through their nose. There's no way to really stop that. Um, but good. Um, all right, let's, let's begin by talking about the assembly process of the oboe. And uh, um, I think, what, what would you start with with the oboe here? I see you hold the, mm -hmm. the top, the upper joint. The first thing I would start with for oboe would be actually letting your reed get nice and moist. So you can have a small container of water or there are different types of special soaking liquids for certain types of double reeds where you can just set it in. I've been, uh, you can also moisten it with your mouth if you're actively doing it right before you play. So I've had mine soaking for a little bit before the video. But also, I would start with the first joint here, which is the top part of the oboe. And when you put it into the bottom joint, you want to be careful not to push down on any keys because that can bend them or bend any of the posts that are holding them in. When you push them in, you can also push down on some of the keys to make them not slide, but you want to be careful when pushing this in because if you push this top key, it will move this right there, which right here can run directly into it. And if you push directly down on this top joint on that, you could bend a number of keys by just pushing this. If you leave this key flat, it should slide right over it. You'll want to do a slight twisting motion there so it doesn't tear the cork on the tenon joints there. Once you have that together, make sure it's lined up. You can usually tell right at this spot right here if those two pieces of the key work are lining up. Once you do that, what I will do is I will hold these keys down here and put the bell 
on. Again, you want to make sure on this, you do want to push this key and lift up that, that small key there, to make sure it slides over. So, so it's otherwise, kind of, it's kind of like a paddle key mm -hmm. that sets over the top, like the clarinet has a similar thing between the upper and lower joints. So I mean, no, perfectly fine. So then I'm going to make sure my reed is still moist. Okay, what do we call the sound that we make with the reed when it's by itself? The reed, when you're just making a basically buzz on it, vibrating the two pieces of uh, reed material with each other, is a crow. It's a crow, so just like the bird, just like the bassoon. It's the same thing, except a lot smaller. Do you, do you want me to do it? Yeah, you can crow for him. Yeah, one thing is when you crow the reed, you want to try to get a growly, dirty sound, what they call a dirty crow sound, rather than a pure tone. You, you actually want it to growl a little bit. So um, see if you can get it to get the harmonics to speak. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, you got a little bit more, a little rougher sound that, that helps it um, speak better. Those are overtones on the reed. Okay. As he's putting it together there, I'm going to ask him, Jeff, do you, do you feel like a neck strap is necessary with the oboe, or does it have to be there, and why? A lot of players prefer neck straps just because it will take a lot of the strain of the instrument off your right thumb. As some people can build up more tension or through previous activities or injuries with their hand. It can build up more tension. When you have the tension in the thumb, it can slow down a lot of the movement on the top part of the hand here, including your first finger over there. So I generally prefer using a neck strap for both oboe and clarinet, but a lot of players don't use them. It's mainly personal preference. Yeah, I recommend it, especially for younger players and if they're smaller, um, just pretty tall. So, but still, um, it does stabilize the instrument and then they don't have to work quite as hard. They can keep their hands relaxed. They might get better facility and ability to play fast if they have the next strap and doing that. Um, how about talking just a little bit about form in your embouchure now? Um, talk about that and then tell us, you know, well, what would you do um, and what would you tell us to, to do with forming the embouchure? If they were already playing another woodwind instrument, such as the clarinet, I would say the bottom lip is going to be similar to that of a clarinet, where you roll your lip over your teeth, but also you're going to double that with your top. So you have both of your, both top and bottom teeth covered with your lip, kind of like doing an impression of an old person with no teeth, that a lot <laughs> of people do. And then the reed will be placed directly between that two cushioned teeth plates like that right and then we have pressure pretty equal pressure top and bottom we also have pressure coming in from the sides too so that it makes a seal around that reed and uh, area and that's what causes the corners um, I say corners should be firm but not a smile I'm sure where you're like do that. Yeah, we don't want to pull the corners too far back where it looks like your smile, but it's kind of, you could kind of feel the marble bag or the drawstring pulling the embouchure around the reed a little bit, but not puckering either. We don't want to poke our lips forward. It's hard to do over your teeth with that idea. Okay. Um, it's very important that you keep the embouchure stable, that the embouchure stays still and is not moving around. The corners pretty much should stay locked the whole time. That's why you may see oboe players, like they'll just for a second, they may relax their corners for a minute and then pull them back because the muscles can only stay tense for so long before they get really tired and then they just give out. So um, it's real important that you constantly um, constantly try that. All right, um, 
after we continue with the Amisher now, um, let's talk about some finger positions and uh, proper posture. What, what would you tell your students about po proper posture and how to, um, with the ones you teach? Proper posture for most wind instruments is going to be sitting closer to the end of your chair. So right now I'm not playing, so I'm reclining a bit. But you'll sit closer to the end, you'll put your feet about shoulder widths apart, even that. That's different for each student. Some students, they're built a little bit wider, a bit closer together. You want to sit fairly straight up. And then with the oboe, you are going to want to, the uh, way you're going to hold the instrument will be, instead of farther down, like a clarinet, it's going to be a bit closer to perpendicular with your teeth, like that. So that will get you a much purer sound for it. You want you don't you won't want to hang your arms too low because then you won't want you won't be able to get the proper facility of your fingers. You don't want it too high or else you'll build way too much tension in your upper arm. No deodorant commercial. Right? No deodorant commercial. Right, there we go. <laughs> so about like this. You just you don't want to lift up your arms so high that you lift your shoulders. So drop your shoulders and puts you in a natural position like we would with anything from conducting all the way through playing an instrument. You want the shoulders down and relaxed. So um, let's go ahead and kind of get a close up. When you sit or stand, this is another quick question. When you sit or stand, you do the same thing, correct? Mm -hmm. you, the angle of the instrument stays the same whether you're yep. standing or sitting. Um, again, neck strap will help that. Um, Yeah, let's go ahead and um, show where the fingers go on there okay. and see if you can explain that and see if we can get the camera in kind of close to it. Um, I don't know which hand you're going to start with. So. I'll start with the right hand right now. The right hand, you have your thumb, which is placed on this right here. A lot of uh, woodwind instruments will have this. Clarinet does. Bassoon has something kind of similar for the hand that's mainly uh, moving in closer. But the oboe and clarinet, uh, importantly have this. This one has a small piece of cork right here for comfort. I use this rubber cushion on it. It's a little bit more comfortable. Some of the more professional instruments will have adjustable ones because some people's thumbs like to sit a little bit higher or a little bit lower. So even clarinets will have that. On the front of the instrument, you have your first finger here. So mainly these, these large three that look like buttons will sit there. And then your pinky can switch around and play any of these three keys right here. So depending on what type of notes you need. So basically what we're talking about is we're dealing with three fingers on both hands. So those are basic starting, just like we do with clarinet or saxophone. Those are your main fingers and then your pinky does other things mm -hmm. and stuff. But that's a main thing, kind of like even the flute phone or the recorder. Um, you're dealing with basic six fingers mm -hmm. that you're adjusting. So, good. On the left hand, you have your left thumb has this key right here, which you won't always be using it. So sometimes you will rest it off the key. Sometimes I will move it just a little bit below so I don't accidentally hit it. What is that called? Is that the octave key? It is an octave key, yes. Yeah, like clarinet though, what do we call it? The register key. And so what interval does that change in the clarinet? Uh, sixth. Twelfth. Twelfth. Well, twelfth is what, yeah. what we do. Um, but the octave key is an octave key just like saxophone. So that's like a half hole. Then it's a six. No, I'm kidding. That's not true. You can make it a six if you use some strange technique. Okay. All right. We can, we can do that. Um, so um, octave key, thumb on the back. On the front, you will have your third finger, I'm going to start from the bottom, right there. On this one here, you have this key that has this extra tag of metal hanging off of it. Sometimes you will use that for certain notes that play more in tune. Usually, you will just cover it like a key. However, on some of the other notes, you will slide your finger to allow that small opening to be present. So that will create a better tone with some of the notes by having a small amount of air being able to escape through there. What do we call that? What technique is that? Half hold. That's a half hold fingering. It always happens with the left hand index finger. Mm -hmm. So just like on the bassoon, the half hold technique is on the left hand index finger 
first finger, however you want to say that there. Good. Um, when would you use an alternate fingering to play? When would be usage of that? An alternate fingering would be used when you have something very rapid or very awkward fingering, usually at a greater speed. So something where going to your normal fingering in a scale would just be too awkward to move your fingers over there very fast. So you might do something quick. Often the alternate fingerings don't have as good a tone, so you don't use them in slower, more legato passages, exactly. just so you don't get to hear it. Sometimes they're a little bit out of tune. Also, some trills. If you have a weird trill where you have a lot of cross fingerings, a cross fingering would be where you lift up one or more fingers and lay down one or more fingers at the same time. So something like that type of movement where you're switching the direction of fingers. Something like that where a trill fingering might be just moving one extra key. That's ideally you want to move as few keys as possible. So the more fingers they have to move in contrasting positions, the more difficult the trill would be to play and probably would sound even more awkward. So, But the better the oboe too, the more alternate fingerings there are that will help you be able to do what you need to do in an easier way and not fight with the instrument. Um, what about vibrato? Can you talk a little bit about vibrato? Like, what do you prefer if you played vibrato on the oboe, and why? For oboe, I would probably use diaphragmic vibrato, which is where you use your lungs and your diaphragm to create what type of vibrato you want. It's more like, it's type, the type of vibrato that you would use on a flute, where it's more like, where you're changing the uh, speed of the air through your diaphragm rather than through your mouth or through manually uh, holding the instrument. There, those would be the other two types, which would be manual or hand vibrato, where you actually move the instrument itself. Then mouth vibrato, where you slightly do a, a slight chewing motion. Yeah, so the chewing. jaw is moving a little bit. I think moving the oboe itself, that probably wouldn't be prefer just because as you move that reed in and out, not only do you take a chance of it stopping vibrating, but you get a different tone quality where that mm -hmm. reed is in your mouth. So I don't know if I would yeah. use hand vibrato on an oboe, but um, maybe there is somebody who does that. I don't I probably wouldn't either. I wouldn't. The diaphragmatic is safe. And with the bassoon, I think that's the preferred one. It doesn't mean that people don't use their jaw. Sometimes use a combination of a little bit of jaw and a little bit of diaphragm. Um, you want to be careful not to use the throat because that gets kind of a weird sound there. All right. Um, I don't know. Can you do a little bit of vibrato? Can you play a note and let us hear it straight first and then let us hear it with yeah. a little bit of vibrato if you can? If I can get my no reed. pressure. I might get the reed a little bit wet <laughs> so I can get a sound. There's just a straight tone there with diaphragmic vibrato, which is what I would probably use on oboe, as well as flute, typically it's used. Good, if it gets a little too wide, it could really, it could choke out a little bit, so, but good. All right, how about playing for me a uh, uh, scale? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the C works. If you want to start at the top and work your way down, that's, that's what I'm going to do. Then. I will look at my handy fingering chart here as I'm not a competent oboist yet. Actually, the lowest note on this oboe, and probably most, they might go down another half step. A very fine oboe might have a half step lower than that. But the middle C, um, this is a concert pitch instrument. So what does that mean? It means it will the notes that it plays are sounding exactly as they are written, with no transposition needed at all. Right. So it's an untransposed instrument. Just plays what the piano plays. Um, what kind of bore does the instrument have? Do oboe, you know? I believe, I believe it's conical. It, it is conical, and um, 
it, it has its own little character about, you know, it's still, it looks like it's all cylindrical, like it's the same size, but it actually gradually gets bigger. And some of that's because of the reed being so small, it has to, otherwise it would have a real awkward sound and actually have some major intonation difficulties. And it also warms up the instrument a lot better. Conical bore is a warmer, warmer tone. Um, bassoon is the same way, so conical bore instrument. Um, do you have any kind of little tune that you can play? Is there anything maybe in the, in the book there that looks simple? I will briefly. Five, I think, might have something. And you could add a little vibrato if you'd like. There's a, say there was three blank blanks. Have a little rain on. Oh, I, can, like, I can do that. Be comfortable with Transpose that. Transpose it a little bit. <laughs> if you can, and I recommend that, like vibrato, you can do on like the half notes or whole notes, the longer value notes. But I wouldn't do vibrato on every single note, at least not in the early stages. Um, as you get better at it, then you can incorporate different levels of vibrato that give you that variety. So if you want to at least play a little tune if you're, if you're okay. Yes, it may not sound good though. Oh, okay, okay. We'll be all right. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> Do you want to play it that low? Well, I don't want to knock it higher. <laughs> changes because he's not playing the oboe for a long time this is uh, um, kind of a new new thing but actually his low register is popping out really nice it's very centered and uh, in tune so anything else about the oboe that that you noticed as you've been working on it? and that's another reason not to put you on the spot but um, knowing that you're just starting to kind of get used to it and what you're doing. Is there anything that, that you would think, okay, with my students, I, I need to be careful of this or I need to show them that as, as a beginning teacher how mm -hmm. of the oboe, so to say? Probably mainly not to bite down on the reed as much because it's easy if you're not thinking of it to slip, especially your top lip, off of the teeth and bite it almost like a clarinet reed. Also, just holding it with tension is a lot of that. Since it's such a complex instrument, you're like, oh, I just really need to tense up. Pushing down the keys hard because it's such unique stretches. A lot of these are you're stretching your fingers a little bit more than a lot of the other woodwind instruments where you keep your fingers a lot closer, especially if you're coming from flute or something where you're not stretching quite as much or piccolo. But also being uh, not squeezing too hard on the instrument, on the keys. Sure. I think because the embouchure is so tight, that travels down to our hands too. So we, we know we have to keep a tight embouchure, so then we automatically, our whole body tries to get involved to do the same thing. And it's kind of the opposite. You have to relax your hands, but keep that embouchure firm so that you can do what you need to do. Any, any other thoughts or anything else that you can think? Not that I can think of. All right. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Appreciate you taking time for me and uh, look forward to seeing you all next class. Thank you so much.